Welcome to the PM services of the Northfield Church of Christ for Sunday, January the 3rd, 2021. Yes, I did say 2021. Get used to writing that down. I know it's kind of tough after uh, 365 days of 2020, but we are in a new year. Uh, this evening, we will uh, sing several songs, have a couple of prayers, and I will deliver a lesson to you that uh, I hope will be uh, both edifying, uh, enlightening, and uh, in our service this evening, we will glorify the Lord. We're singing from Songs of Faith and Praise, and so if you have a uh, songbook with you and you would like to sing along with us, please turn to hymn number 164, 164. Emmanuel, God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. His name is called Emmanuel, God with us. One five eight, just a few pages back. One fifty eight. Jesus, you're the sweetest name of all. Jesus, you always hear me when I call. Oh, Jesus. You pick me up each time I fall. You're the sweetest, the sweetest name of all. Jesus, how I love to praise your name. Jesus, you're still the first, the last, the same. Oh, Jesus. You died and took away my shame. You're the sweetest, the sweetest name of all. Jesus, you're the soon and coming King. Jesus, we need the love that you can bring. Oh, Jesus. We lift our voices up and sing. You're the sweetest, the sweetest name of all. You're the sweetest, the sweetest name of all. Number 579, 579. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Jesus is my rock, is my fortress, is my deliverer, in him will I trust. Praise the name of 
Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for just a short amount of time this evening that we can uh, gather together in your name, uh, how be it in a virtual manner, that uh, we can sing praises to you, offer prayers to you, and hopefully uh, get into your word and uh, garner something this evening that uh, we can meditate on for a while and that we can uh, gather something up from your word that will be helpful to us. There's so many uh, on our prayer list, dear Heavenly Father, that I pray that you will be with. I pray that you will be with our brother, Alan Crabb, as he's in the hospital at Mainland uh, with some respiratory issues. Be with him and with your hand uh, be upon him and those that uh, take care of him. I pray that you would be with our friend Pat, who has contacted the COVID-19 uh, while uh, she is being hospitalized. And I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would give her strength to uh, overcome this. I thank you that our uh, uh, sister Marty and her husband Charlie are recovering from their bout with the COVID and uh, they are getting uh, stronger and stronger each day. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would just continue to bless us, that you would continue to comfort us, and we just pray, dear Heavenly Father, that uh, in that you were the God of comfort, that uh, we as Christians would be comforting souls, that uh, we would desire to uh, bring positive things into the life of those around us. Be with us as we enter into this new year, dear Heavenly Father. Help it to bring uh, opportunities to us that perhaps we did not have in 2020 and help us to take advantage of those opportunities. We pray this prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And at the same opening, I hope you didn't close your songbook, uh, we are at number 578. 578. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of hosts, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship him in righteousness. We will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to him we give. Hallelujah to the King of Kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of hosts, who is the great I Am. Oh, thank you for participating in song. I uh, trust that the Lord has been praised in this song and that uh, we, we're both benefited and uplifted by it. I told you last week that I was done with the birth of Jesus and uh, 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 we are still, I, I guess, in what we might call a post-Christmas setting. Uh, but uh, as I uh, looked over some things, I thought that there was something that... Uh, I probably didn't emphasize enough, and we did have a, a lesson uh, specifically wrapped around Mary, and uh, this one is, is um, obviously Mary is going to be involved in this one, uh, but um, I thought that there was a concept 
that uh, we need it to understand a, a little bit better perhaps than we do. And so out of uh, the first chapter of Matthew and the first chapter of Luke, we are going to, for just a few moments this evening, talk about the virgin birth of Jesus. And what we would like to do uh, in this lesson is to build confidence in the fact that Jesus was born of a virgin. And uh, the means by which we are going to do this is by looking through some scriptures to give proof, uh, to give proof of the necessity of and the benefit of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And so as we, as we begin this lesson this evening, I would like to hearken back to the words of Franklin Camp. Franklin Camp was a minister who ministered during the early 1900s, actually through the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, even later than that. And he said something that uh, I found quite provocative. And I'd like you to take a look at it yourself and see if you find it as provocative as I have found it. Here's what he said. The virgin birth and Matthew 1 is to the New Testament what Genesis 1 and the creation account is to the Old Testament. All right? I think perhaps that bears repeating because I'm uh, he made a comparison here, and I think the comparison is a, is a pretty good one. The comparison is this. The virgin birth and Matthew chapter 1 is to the New Testament what Genesis 1 and the creation account is to the Old Testament. And Here's the point he was trying to get across, and let's see whether we agree with it or not. If what one does not believe in the virgin birth, one cannot believe in the rest of the New Testament. Just like if one does not accept that God created the heavens and the earth, one cannot trust the whole Old Testament. Now, I know there are people who claim to deny those creations, but still believe the rest of the Testaments. In reality, that cannot be so. Now, as we look at our Christian faith, and as we look at the Christian doctrine, I doubt that there is anyone who is within my listening voice this evening, who does not believe in the virgin birth. But I think we need to study and maybe even restudy that subject to reaffirm our faith. And so, uh, in this lesson, I would like to uh, accomplish three things. One, I'd like us to prove from Scripture that the Bible affirms the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Two, I would like to show the necessity of the virgin birth. And three, to show the benefits of the virgin birth. And so the lesson will be divided into those three categories. So the lesson is threefold. And so let's go right into the meat of this and look at the proof of the virgin birth. All the way through Matthew and Luke, we have the account of Jesus being born. And in Matthew chapter 1, we have the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. Notice the wording. And for you number crunchers out there, notice the wording, father of, 
It is repeated 39 times as we follow the genealogy of Jesus. But not so with Joseph. This is the genealogy of Jesus, not the genealogy of Joseph. Because Joseph may have been Jesus' surrogate father here on earth, but he was not Joseph's, he was not Jesus' biological father. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse uh, 19, uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew shows the innocence of Joseph. And when Joseph finds out that his betrothed, Mary, is with child, um, he had a, a, a right to, and he had a thought, and he considered that uh, he would put her away. Uh, not wanting to disgrace her, to put her away privately because she had bo broken uh, that betrothal. But indeed, she did not break the betrothal. Joseph's innocence. Joseph is not the father of Jesus. In Luke chapter uh, 1, verses 26 and 27, Jesus, uh, Luke declares that virgin birth of Jesus. He makes this declaration, and that is in verses 26 and 27. And if we go just a few verses further, in Luke chapter 1, verse 34, Mary declares her virginity. And not only this, if we go to Luke chapter 1, verse 35, the very next verse, the angel of the Lord declares her virginity, as does the angel in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20. And so, when Christ makes this claim to be Son of God, in John chapter 2, verse 16, he's telling the truth, isn't he? Even though uh, when people would vicariously look at this family with Joseph as the dad and Mary as the mom, assuming from everything they know, and they understood that biologically even back then, that Joseph was the father of Jesus. But we know different because we understand that everything pointed to the fact that Mary would be impregnated by the Holy Spirit of God. This is the only time this has taken place. And by the way, John 2.16 lets us know that, and there are many, many, many other scriptures and passages that maybe hint at the virgin birth. Now, we have kind of an interesting passage if we if we go back to Genesis chapter 2, uh, chapter 3, I'm sorry, in verse uh, 15, where it talks about the seed of woman. Now, this kind of <laughs> explodes what we know biologically and anatomically that the, the uh, father produces the th seed from which the child is born, but the, the seed of the woman, she also has to make her contribution, all right? And so the Holy Spirit provided the seed this, to add to the seed of woman so that she would have a child and this child would be born in a physically natural way. Now, in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, the Apostle Paul uh, words about Jesus that he was made of a woman. All right? He was made of a woman. And so Jesus came forth the way everybody has, as we understand the birth process, 
Jesus came forth from a woman. And Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7 kind of reaffirms that. He was, it says that Jesus was made. Do you get that? That Jesus was made, almost like he was manufactured because of the unusual nature. He was born of a virgin, of a woman who did not know the seed, the physical seed of a man. And finally, when Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, it says that Jesus was, now get this, he was manifested in the flesh, or he was revealed in the flesh, not born of the flesh. He was manifested or revealed in the flesh. And so the greatness and I guess what you might also call the uniqueness of the miracles and many claim similar miracles as to what uh, Jesus and others did. No one, absolutely no one has claimed a virgin birth. And so to deny the virgin birth of Jesus is to deny the inspiration of the Bible because the writers were inspired through the Holy Spirit and Jesus was produced through the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, we can take uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, all scripture is profitable for, and throw it out the window if we don't believe the virgin birth of Jesus. If we do not believe this is true, how, how do we know that what the Bible tells us about how we're to gain salvation is true? We might as well throw our hands up and wring our hands and say, I, I, I'm at a loss here. We don't have to be at a loss because the scriptures point to and explain the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And so what we first have here is the proof of the virgin birth of Jesus. I told, told you this was three parts. Two, why was this necessary? The necessity of the virgin birth. Well, what did Jesus call himself and what was he addressed as in the Bible? It certainly says that he was the son of God, doesn't it? But it says he was the son of man. All right, so Jesus was the son of God and Jesus was the son of man. And by necessity, this had to happen through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. If Jesus had been fathered by a man, then Jesus is totally human. He could not pay for our sins. There would be no need for him to be crucified upon the cross. The sins of the world could not be placed upon his shoulders. Because Jesus was born of God. Now, if it went the other way, if God just simply threw Jesus down onto the earth, then he would be God. But he couldn't relate to man because he would not be human. When Jesus was tempted by Satan, he was tempted as a human. He had fasted for 40 days. He was in a weakened, he was physically in a weakened condition. He was as weak as he possibly could be when Satan tempted him. And so he had to resist the temptation, both as the son of God and as the son of man, so that when we're tempted, we can understand that Jesus the man was tempted too. There was the temptation of those that mocked him on the cross to come down off the cross. And you know what? Jesus could have. 
You know, anybody that walked on water, anybody that changed water into wine, anybody who healed the lame and healed, healed death, healed the lepers, could certainly do that, but he chose not to because he had to suffer as the man and then suffer spiritually being separated from God. And so, one, we have the proof of Jesus' virgin birth, and two, the benefits of the virgin birth is what we're coming to next. The proof, the necessity, and now the benefits of the virgin birth. One of the things that it talks about Jesus being in our New Testament is being our mediator and being our high priest. Jesus was the perfect mediator. When we have mediators, mediators most must understand both sides of the issue being discussed. Both sides of the issue that need to be decided. The mediator cannot be one-sided. The mediator has to look at both sides and weigh everything to come to the good conclusion. By God coming through humans, Jesus was able to be the mediator, the mediator between God because he was the son of God to man because he was the son of man. And what we're told is that he was a compassionate mediator. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 to 18. Now, uh, Jesus modeled God. In John chapter 14, verses 8 and 9, Philip said to Jesus, Why don't you show us the Father? And we know the words there, don't we? We know the words that Jesus spoke. Jesus said to Philip, when you see me, you see the Father. Now let's get some extra stuff here. Because you know, in the Old Testament, Jesus was forecast to have come. And so there were prophecies there were prophecies about being born of a virgin. There were prophecies about the city of Bethlehem. And so all of that being said, in Isaiah chapter 4, uh, chapter 7, verse 14. Now, I understand that this was uh, specifically talking the background to King Ahaz. But here's what the prophet Isaiah said to comfort Ahaz. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. That's why we sang that song this evening. All right. He said he would give Ahaz a sign. Now, we might ask ourselves the question, how could this sign be the sign of Jesus' birth 700 years ahead? Ahaz was afraid for his life right then and there because of a couple of evil uh, enemies, uh, Rezin and, and Pekah. So that being, interestingly enough, uh, we might say, well, you know, maybe this isn't talking about that. However, if we go to Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, and let me remind you of these scriptures, it says, now all of this took place and this is the conception and the birth of Jesus. Okay, this is Matthew chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. It says, Now all this took place to fulfill 
what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And Matthew quotes Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, word for word. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Wow. In Jewish writing, to fulfill, now remember, could be used in more than one way. All right? Yet, Matthew used this prophetic writing of Isaiah, even when we might think that Isaiah, in talking to Ahaz, wasn't talking about Jesus 700 years. Why would that bring comfort to someone who is afraid of a couple of enemies? Let's take a look at the three ways that fulfilled might be used. One, it could be used literally. It was applied in only one situation, the destruction of Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 34. Okay, this was fulfilled literally. Secondly, it could be a dual prophecy, such as Solomon building the temple and Christ establishing the church. 2 Samuel 7, verses 13 and 14. So you get it? The, the fulfillment could be literal or it could be a dual prophecy or thirdly, it could just be something that was similar. All right? It could be something that was similar. Now, if we compare Matthew chapter 1 and verse 22 with verse 25, and it says, But he kept her a virgin till after she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. All right? It says he, he kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. All right? She was a virgin until she gave birth to the son. Now, if we, if we go back to the Old Testament, interestingly enough, um, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, doesn't have anything to do with Jesus when he talked about uh, the, the uh, people of God coming out of Egypt, the 12 tribes. But Matthew saw a comparison. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse 15, it says, if we read verse 14, it said, Joseph got up, took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. Remember, he went to Egypt. And then it says, he remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fill, fulfill what had been spoken by God through the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. That was Hosea 1. Now, even though Hosea probably didn't know he was talking about Jesus, and he wasn't, Matthew still makes that comparison. Isn't that, isn't that a wonderful comparison? Matthew saw the comparison, right? Just like he saw the comparison of a son being born of a virgin that Isaiah had talked about 700 years previously. He recognized this. And Matthew emphasized that it was a virgin birth. He even used the right word for virgin birth that we have come to know. And so, as we conclude this evening, remember, the virgin birth of Jesus in Matthew 1 is to the New Testament what Genesis 1 is to the creation. If one doesn't believe the virgin birth of Jesus, he can't believe the rest of the New Testament. And we have no idea what our salvation is all about or how we ought to live our lives. But it is a truth. And what we've looked at 
this evening is the proof of the virgin birth, the necessity of the virgin birth, and the benefits of the virgin birth. We have been so blessed. We've been so blessed that our God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to earth in human form to uh, feel the pain of this world, to feel hunger, to feel thirst, but yet also to have the power to forgive sins, to have the power to do miracles, that he was both God and man. And the only reason he was God and man is because he was conceived through the Holy Spirit of a virgin. I hope this has been an uplifting message to you. I hope it was as uplifting to you as it was to me to put it together and, uh, and flesh this out and uh, explain it to each one of us. I pray that as we look at our Bibles, we will see the truths that are there, and they're there so that we will know how to live our lives so that we can one day live with the Lord eternally. Let's all pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this short amount of time that we've had this evening. I pray, dear God, that uh, uh, we've been blessed by this time that we've spent together. I pray that you have accepted our praise. I, I so hope that you have listened to our prayers. And also pray that some of the things that I said will touch our hearts and help us to have even more confidence in what our wonderful Holy Spirit-inspired Bibles have to say to us. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father, as we uh, just try to learn more of your word so that we can be the just and holy and righteous people that you want us to be. I pray that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would continue to bless us and help us, dear Heavenly Father, to uh, take Jesus with us wherever we go in our lives and be proud of being Christians. I pray this prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Uh, have a very uh, safe evening, and I hope all of us have a safe and prosperous 2021. May God bless us all. It may be at home.